All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Kelly Williams and I'm with the Plant Based Kitchen. And today I want to welcome Timory, who is the nutrition professor. So, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Yes, my name is Timory Hagenberger yep. and I am a registered dietitian and I have a master's in public health and I'm a certified uh, exercise physiologist through the American College of Sports mm -hmm. Medicine. But I am a nutrition professor at heart. Um, all the way to the core. So that's actually why we went with the nutritionprofessor.com and um, because that's what I do, whether I'm at the soccer field with my kids and talking to a mom about nutrition or I'm in the grocery store in the produce aisle and trying to give tips you know, there or whether I'm in my classroom. I'm a full-time professor um, here in Sacramento. So I that's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in the plant-based world and, and like where you came from and how everything's kind of evolved. I'd love to hear the story. Yeah, so I, my mom is actually a dietitian. So yeah. I grew up with that in the house. Um, and But it's whenever it's something that close, you want to do everything but. So I wanted to be a race car driver, an <laughs> FBI agent, and all these other things. Yep. But then whenever I did a project in class, I always did something about health and nutrition because that was my comfort zone mm -hmm. and I'd go with my mom to the continuing education you know I'd be the only one taking notes and and then I thought maybe I should just be doing this because mm -hmm. I loved cooking I love the cooking side and I started writing down recipes six or seven years old and you know in the kitchen with my grandma and my you know both both grandparents and my parents but I like love science and so I thought well I could marry them both mm -hmm. I didn't want to turn cooking into something that I loved and then just kind of despised because it was 18 hour days in the kitchen and so I thought okay I can follow kind of suit with my mom but more of a technical more of the science side of it and um, so for 17 years I've been a dietitian but it was frustrating because I felt like there weren't a lot of teachable moments. You know, when I worked in the hospital, patients are uncomfortable, they're scared, mm -hmm. you know, new diagnosis and overwhelmed, and then the dietitian comes in. <laughs> and that means, what is she going to take away? Yeah. You know, so, exactly. So I didn't want that, and I always loved interacting with people, and so I thought there has to be another way to get the yeah. word out. And a friend of mine um, that I knew was a dietitian had taught, and I thought, well, maybe I could you know, do that. And I was asking her about it, and she said, oh, my gosh, it's terrible. I said, well, what do you mean? And I had already agreed to teach a night class, and she said, oh, my gosh, you stand up there, and people ask you questions, and when you don't know the answer, it's just terrible. And I thought, oh, what did I get myself into? So the first night, I was up there and talking, and I fell in love. And I thought, well, if I don't know the answer, then I'll just, we'll look it up exactly. together. Yep. Or I, that's just life. And so I just, I was bitten, and I thought, whatever I have to do, I want to continue doing this. So that was now 17 years ago wow. that I started teaching at the college level. So I've been full-time for 12, almost 13, um, and I just love it. But about six years ago, maybe between six and seven, mm -hmm. I went to a cooking class in my local area. I love cooking. I had mentioned that. And so any opportunity to just learn one little tidbit of information, yep. I'm in. So I went to this little class at a church um, cooking class and it was all plant-based. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Again, just using ingredients in different ways. I don't think I even knew a vegetarian ever yeah. in my life. I mean, we were definitely omnivore on the quote-unquote healthy side, right. you know, always lean chicken, take the skin off, you know, not that milk and all that. And she was talking about it from the animal perspective, and I had never really thought about that. And she actually had said she didn't even like vegetables, but she just didn't do, want to do anything to her animals. And so I thought, well, I love vegetables. That's easy. And what, you know, what is this? What is all of this? And so I started doing some research, and then I found Forks Over Knives pretty shortly after that. And I thought, where have you been all of my life? Because all of the work that I'd ever done with patients, I always felt in clients that they went, you know, one step forward yep. and then three steps back. It's true. And it was just so frustrating because I'd work so hard and give them ideas and then they'd come back and say, I got a deep fat fryer for Christmas or, <laughs> you know, whatever. And I just think, oh my gosh, put my 
head on the wall. I mean, it was just crazy, banging my head against the wall. So when I found this plant-based, I started learning more. And then I thought, well, for my own family, there's no question. This is as clear as day. And then I had a conversation with my husband, and I said, how am I going to teach? Because my textbook is a standard, you know, nutrition textbook. I said, but I can't do this ethically. Just I can't. I can't go up there and say three servings of milk and lean protein with animal protein. I, so I said, I'm going to have to just go tell them the truth, that this is what we see, and then here's all the research. And thank goodness Dr. Greger's website is so accessible yep. because they don't want to hear it from me. They already think, oh, my gosh, you know, she's going, you know, a little on the edge. And, but then they see the research, and, they, and I say, that's what it's about. You make your own decisions. But this is the other side of the story that you don't get from the textbook. And so just like in life, we're in kind of an information overload. So being able to navigate through is huge. Mm-hmm. And something that I always tell my students is that when you don't know, you don't really have a choice because sometimes they get upset and, you know, and think, well, it's my choice. If I want to eat, sure. you know, a Twinkie or whatever, absolutely. But if you don't know what's in a Twinkie and you don't know that there's an alternative to a Twinkie and you just go and eat Twinkies because that's what you've always done, that's not really a choice. Right. It's just kind of following a habit. So once I really embraced, which didn't take long at all, the plant-based then I just went full crazy woman on it. I just, it was so fantastic. I started to offer, a couple of years ago, I started to offer the 21-day kickstart yep. in my classes yep. as extra credit. Because, again, this is nice. what I was teaching were just standard nutrition classes. Mm-hmm. And But I said, well, for extra credit, you know, if you want to dabble in this, that's fine. And I made it small. It was like 15 points out of 1,000. That's great. And so I... You know, it had to be the committed, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it had to be someone who really wanted to do it. And um, so the first semester, I had top five sections. And so I thought maybe three people from each class. I mean, really, I didn't think there were going to be many. So I expected maybe 10 or 12. I had 130. Wow. And, wow. oh, it was just fantastic. So successful that I actually started a club on campus called Top Thrive on Plants. And so we meet every single Wednesday. We do cooking demos. The students are getting practice doing cooking demos. We do top locks instead of pot locks. We're a pop club, right? And we do different ethnicities, different cultures every month. So I have Pakistani women that are making sushi. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. My college is the ninth most diverse college, community college in the nation out of like 1500 plus so we just it's so wonderful we really can celebrate Mm -hmm. all the different cultures and then meet in the plant-based you know plant curious plant strong plant friendly you know everywhere everywhere on the continuum um so but it's been so fantastic that we developed my um colleague and i developed a plant-based nutrition and sustainable ag certificate program so that is launching in August. So that's going to be a three class in person in Sacramento here, but three classes, plant-based nutrition, plant-based cooking, mm-hmm. and then we're partnering with horticulture and they're teaching sustainable ag in our gardens. Wow. So the that's students wonderful. are going to be able to get this complete picture, um, you know, of what is it, why we yeah. should eat it, how we prepare it, and then how they can grow it. Um, so it's just growing, growing, growing. Mm-hmm. and. It's just so exciting because the student response Mm -hmm. is just phenomenal. And you know, I mean, nothing works like this does. True, true. I mean, do you feel like you're on an infomercial? I often do in class. I feel like, (laughs) and we get the free blender with it. You know, if only we could get the free blender. But every, and it works for this disease and this disease and this condition. And you'll have more energy and it's Mm -hmm. cheaper and I do. I feel like I'm on an infomercial. <laughs> it's crazy, but I love it. It gives me more passion than I ever, and I've always been passionate about nutrition, yeah. but this is just... It's like, that's it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So, so how many people do you have signed up for your August program? Because, I mean, August is right around the door. 
Right. So I have, I think I have two spots left in one class and a few spots in the other. So it's wonderful. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be excellent. Yeah. And we want to offer it every semester, um, those classes. That's so wonderful. We just, we're a little ahead of the curve. You know, with this, okay. so that's where we want to be. <laughs> exactly. You want to be because you want people, you're building a community. I mean, it sounds like you've got these students and this, the college and stuff that's all around this and building this huge community, which is fabulous. I absolutely wonder. I mean, I think it's wonderful. It's just great. It is. And then we're seeing in the area, too, more and more restaurants. There's uh, some nice. talk about some really good restaurants coming in, you know, that are going to support because Sacramento's farm to fork. You know, that's the yeah. capital now. So trying to bring this whole thing in, but do the plant-based, you know, that's my emphasis is really the plant-based piece. So nice. So you do this, so you do everything at the college and you've got all these students and stuff that you're helping and learning and it's all, you know, it's, it's great information. So do you also do things on your own to do yeah. for education and that? So can you talk a little yes. bit about that. So I also, I'm always doing many, many things. But um, one of the other things I do is I write an article every month for our local newspaper in my town. And so I, several years ago, I started that in 2009. And I realized that only, you know, how many people in your little neighborhood get the paper on that day and see my article. And so I don't live where my classes are. are I don't live in Sacramento. And so my students wouldn't have access to the article. So I put a website together. So I have all of my articles on the website mm -hmm. and then recipes. And then several years ago, I made a connection with a grower in our area that grows legumes. And he has all the heirloom beans. And so he has like 54 varieties of beans. So I love beans with all of my heart, all the legumes. And we connected and they had, he had a spot on a farm bureau show. They were going to interview his farm mm -hmm. and it was called California Bountiful. So California Bountiful has a magazine and it has a TV program. So once a week they do a 30 minute um, show and they'll typically do three sections and they'll visit a restaurant, they'll visit a farm, they'll, you know, just different mm -hmm. places in Sacramento or in um, California. And so he said, would you please be part of it so that you can talk about the nutrition side? And I said, oh, I would love to. So we filmed it. And then the hostess said, oh, you're good. I want to have you do more of this. Would you be willing? Well, I have done now 36 segments for them. And so I go to the farmer's market typically, and I focus on one piece of produce. Mm -hmm. um, so red cabbage, for example. And I say, you know, why choose red cabbage? How to pick that? You know, if you're looking at a whole bunch of them, you know, and all just little tips like that, how to store it. Yep. And then it goes right into my kitchen, and then we prepare a recipe with it. Love it. So they're somewhere between four and seven minutes long, um, and they air on 31 stations in California, but also a couple across the United States, some satellite. And then because they're on YouTube, then they're also on my website. So then that's helpful because a student can say, well, what do you do with a beat? You know, and then they can, how do yeah. you even know if this is a good one? Yeah. And so they can watch that. Um, so that's available for everybody. So I have those videos. And then I've done some podcast interviews, um, which have been fun, but that's also been related to a big, gigantic project that I took on, which was a book. Yes. Um, so, yes, that was interesting because I have had these recipes on the website mm -hmm. for a while. And so I had a student who said, that's it. She comes to class one day. She's a Puerto Rican lady. She has an accent. She says, that's it. I'm done. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you have to write the book. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, okay, let me tell you. I had friends over, and I made them some of your recipes, and then they asked me for them. So I gave them the whole pile. Then I had to print them all out again. She said, I've done that three times. I'm not doing it anymore. She said, it's time. You got to write the book. So I thought, oh, my goodness. Okay. Maybe this is the impetus, you know, I, and I had so many things going on at the same time, but I just decided I was going to do it. So I did, I wrote a book and I'll, um, I can tell you about it. Um, and please show. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is it. It's called the foodie bar way. It's pretty. Now, thank you. So there's lots of hearts. There's mm -hmm. no V of any type, right? So this is my, um, I have a little caricature on here. <laughs> One of my students had drawn this little girl, and uh, it says, love the food that loves you back. 
So that's what this is about. And a lot of my students come to me with three concerns. They say no time, yeah. no money, and no experience in the kitchen. Okay. And they mean no experience in the kitchen. I mean, it is amazing. The connection between food is just not there. I mean, there's, they're just living on convenience. I would agree with that. And so I say, okay, that's fine. Let's meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to write it so that it would also, though, be engaging to someone who's had some experience cooking as well. So this idea of the foodie bar, so I set up all of the meals like taco bars. So let me, um, I'll explain, I'll show you two examples, and this will be clear here. So here is a salsa bar. So instead of chopping everything up and mm -hmm. making salsa, you chop everything up and then just let everybody make their own. Because yes. I have two kids, so I have an 11 and a 14 year old, and if I make salsa, and it has cilantro and jalapenos, the only my husband and I will eat it. Yeah. Because Mia doesn't like jalapenos, and Austin doesn't like cilantro. So it's not fun for anybody. But if we do it like this, then they can customize. Everybody's happy. Love it. So the actual subline is one meal, lots of options, everyone's happy. Because as a mom, that's important. Yes. <laughs> you know that it's not possible for everyone to be happy all the time, but True. <laughs> at least you're ninety nine percent there. <laughs> exactly. So I took that concept and then I applied it to breakfast all the way through dessert. So here's an example of a loaded potato bar. So for the students or anyone if when we're busy who don't want to get you want real basic, mm -hmm. there's a basic bar. So a basic okay. bar for this would be something like a baked potato, and of course I have eat the skin, you know, for all the nutrients, and then topping options. So this could be anything from, you know, a can of chili beans, what to look for, greens, fresh, frozen, um, steamed, mixed vegetables, salsa, hot sauce, lime juice, just very easy to access, mm -hmm. not a lot of preparation. So that would be a basic loaded potato bar, and you could do any combination. And then if you wanted to raise the bar, okay, no pun intended, I mean, I am running down the street in the morning going, oh, raise the bar, that's it, I'm going to use it. So, yes, this is a homemade project here. So raising the bar, now instead of having a regular baked potato, maybe then you have a baked sweet potato, or maybe a purple one from the farmer's yeah. market. And instead of a can of chili beans, maybe you make my seasoned black beans, or my cheesy sauce, or my garlic mushrooms. Or it's something like uh, purple cabbage that you may have thought, purple cabbage on a baked potato? Weird. But trust, right? Because I've done the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. I've put all these ideas together. <laughs> so then all the recipes that support the bars are in the back. Like, it's all self-contained. But because I'm a teacher, there has to be space to write. <laughs> because in my books, my cookbooks, I have the margins are full. Yep. And I have post-it notes, and they're sticking mm -hmm. out. So this allows space. So the favorite ingredient combinations, right? If you made an amazing loaded potato bar to write it down, who loved it? Where did you set it up? So these are perfect for potlucks. Yep. Because then you assign each of these to someone. Mm -hmm. Or they oh, choose gotcha. on their own. We use um, some software that's free online called Sign Up. Dot com. Mm -hmm. So we put all of these, and we're, I'm doing one actually in Santa Cruz tomorrow, on Sunday, where I'm doing a speaking engagement, and they're doing one of my bars, and they've just put all of these options on signup.com, and then people are choosing what they plan to bring. That's and it's great. great. I don't know, just to have a conversation about this with you separate, and then we'll continue, but with potlucks, I love cooking, and yep. so do you, and so that's a fun thing. But I didn't realize how intimidating they can be for mm -hmm. people. Because they just don't know, especially if they're not used to cooking or now this is a new way of cooking, they feel like, I don't even know what I could bring and if anybody's going to like it. And, but if you tell them, could you bring a bag of frozen corn or could you bring, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And some weeks, that's, great. And that's not all you can do. But then other people say, oh, no, I want to make your you know, cheesy sauce, so I'll mm -hmm. bring that. So it, it works so well. That's wonderful. So, I love that idea. Uh, the next time you make the foodie bar, what would you do different? And then the last section is up at the top um, to talk about at least is my additions and my recipes. So 
let's say you have an amazing chili that would be excellent on a potato, you would write it there so that when you open this book, you knew, oh yeah, that was that combination that I really liked. So for some people, those of us who cook a lot, this is enough inspiration. You know, you just mix and match. Yep. But there are others that say, well, I need to see a recipe because I get it, but I want to see something. Yeah. So then you see an example of how we do the bar. So here is my Southwestern loaded sweet potato. Pretty. So here's a picture. So all the pictures were taken by my husband or a friend of mine. So nice. again, this is completely homemade. But they're, be um, they're beautiful pictures though. Thank you. I'll show you one with a little story with it. But um, and then I have my little shop smart, prep smart, cook smart tips. You know the nutrition mm -hmm. professor tips about choosing you know different ingredients or um, trying to maximize the nutrition, like chopping up garlic, letting it sit nice. ahead of time, and those types of things. And then our little recipe, you know, based on what this um, was made. And then we go into pasta bar. And there's the basic bar with the noodles and the sauce and the mixins, and then raising the bar, and then we do our Hagen Burger Party pasta. So it goes all the way through from breakfast all the way through dessert. And something that's really fun, there's so there's no oil okay. in this at all, um, and there's no animal products. So what's really fun, though, is I teach people how to make dressings, and that seems to be something that's... Not Big. only I do sauces and pestos and other things, but specifically dressings. So the way that I've done dressings in here is that I've done them in two different bars. So I have the salad dressing bar that's the shaken dressing. So if someone doesn't have a blender and they just have a mason jar, then how can they build a dressing and then play with the flavors? And then again, flavor boosters to raising the bar. And I have several examples of dressings that I use. And then I have the blended dressing bar. So that's if you have a good blender, mm -hmm. then you can play around with creaminess. And there's you know multiple options to do that. And then I have several of my um, creamy dressings nice. that I have in here as examples. So it's really fun because it meets you where you are and then lets you kind of play around and take it to the next level. And what my students have said is that it's an it's self-contained, but it also makes them feel like if they don't have every ingredient, then they can just switch things out, mm -hmm. and that takes some pressure off. You know, they don't have to yeah. be oh, if I, you know, like oh, I could just use parsley or basil or you know, play around. So there's snacks um, and all kinds of things in here. My kids' favorite dessert in here is called dessert nachos. So mm. we <laughs> um, yes. Oh, so they are wow. really amazing. And the chocolate sauce, chips, we make it all. And again, oh, no, good. we don't use any oil. And what I was going to show you, I have some spice blends in the back. Um, and so this one has a story with the picture because my grandmother had my Italian side. She, when she was eight or nine years old, she actually stitched this oh, pretty. little napkin. And so, you know, when I see these pictures, they're not stock photos. They're, this is my heart. I mean, this is, my students say, I wish I could, you know, take you home with me. <laughs> then I would eat great. And so I always say, well, I can't come home with you. But now that I have a book, this is like the closest thing to it. You can actually, you know, go home with, I can go home with you. Um, something that's another thing people always ask is, are these the recipes that you make sometimes, or are these your clutch recipes? This is what we live out of. Nice. I mean, we, it's on our counter, and we use, I mean, that's why. I didn't want a special occasion. Maybe at some point I'll do something like that, but this is tried and true. We're getting home at 9 o'clock at night from soccer, and nice. we've got things in the fridge that I've made so that we can put these bars together. So, and then the only other thing people say is, so is it like a granola bar? No, it's like a taco bar. You know, this idea that everybody mm -hmm. gets their own options. So this has been fun. I, this is a fully self-published, I was telling you, that we, they're in the garage. Yep. They're all in the garage. Um, but we wanted to be able to control the content so yep. that we really, we made the decisions. I made the decisions about what was in here. I have a guide in the beginning for produce, how to keep make the produce last longer. I have, you know, how to set up your kitchen, how to hold a knife, 
It's nice. much more of a practical. Um, it's definitely not a nutrition text to, per se. Um, we are going to be able to use it, which just thrilled. I was thrilled in my cooking class because mm. my dean had said, these pictures are beautiful. The mm -hmm. content is excellent. The price is $25. There's no way That's we a great can price. get something else out there. Yep. So for a picture for every recipe, too, that was something my students said, please. So that's what we did. So it's this has been an adventure because I've been able to speak all over. I spoke in Alaska and Florida and San Francisco and, you know, all over the place with this. Um, so it just... It's like, a, oh, it's a dream come true. It, it's, it's beautiful. Wonderful. So, yes, that's, I also do corporate wellness. Um, I do quite a bit of corporate wellness work, mm -hmm. so that's wonderful, too, because employees, I, you know, they don't have a chance often to take a class. True. You know, they're at work all the time, and so to be able to come in and do some work with them makes a huge difference, because then when they come home and make some of those small changes, their whole family just rises up as far as health wise so you, you mentioned and I'm, I'm no oil also so tell me so let's just tell everybody that's listening that it maybe doesn't know about oil why don't you cook with oil so I grew up Italian with the olive oil yep. right I mean to the point where my dad would say well put olive oil on it it's healthy mm -hmm. it's good for you drizzle it <laughs> exactly oh yes it, it adds mm -hmm. to the dish and then I realized through research that oil as we know is not a whole food um, and so that's an issue, but it's also, it show we have research to show that it causes inflammation mm -hmm. and it puts us at higher risk for cancer. And there's so many insults in our environment that we can't control. You know, we walk, I was running this morning and, you know, a car drives by and you get the exhaust and who knows what's in the air. And, and so some of that we can't control, but in our own, on our own plate, we have much more control. And so... The oils also tend, because they're so high in calories, yep. that you have to play this moderation game, mm -hmm. and that just, I don't know how you feel about the moderation thing, but mm -hmm. for me, the way that I teach my students is moderation is just leads to madness. Right. Because sure. there is, you're always then playing this battle of willpower, and you, in your head, think, well... I worked out this morning, so I can just add a little bit. And whether it be oil or cheese mm -hmm. or what have you, it's so easy to do. And then, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe, I don't know. And, and you, it's just nauseating. But if you decide, you know, I don't, that doesn't work in my body. This is not helping my body. This is not working for me. And then I'm just, I don't do that. I just don't do that. Then you don't have the decision to make. True. Like smoking, I'm not a smoker, and so every time I see someone smoking, I don't look at them and think, oh, I wish I could just smoke. <laughs> I don't have to worry. Yep. They can walk by, and they can be selling cigarettes. I have no, there's no craving there. I have no interest, but it's because I've made a decision that I, I'm not a smoker, yep. and so that's what I've done with the oil, too, and it just so happens that most of our processed food that have oil in them are so heavily processed True. that they're not serving our bodies anyway. Yep. So to just, you're not going to have this, but it was a super processed carbohydrate, you know, used to be a pea yep. and now it's turned into this exploded snack thing that's full of oil. Yep. Not missing out on much. No. So that was a switch though, because a lot of people still say, Oh my gosh, the oil, the oil, but 120 calories per, and I'm not a calorie person at all, but per tablespoon, yeah. while I'm not a calorie person, I love to eat, and I like a lot of bites, so I would much rather eat food and chew the food, and that also includes juices, I'd much rather eat an orange than to drink a little bit of orange juice, yeah. um, and I always tell my students, 44 olives to make one tablespoon of olive oil, mm -hmm. if you thought it was a whole food, then you're sadly mistaken, yeah. because all of that <laughs> fiber and the phytonutrients that are attached to the fiber are still in the waste yep. if you were making olive oil. So it's very romantic to think about olive oil, but it's not very romantic when you think of what it can do to your arteries. That's true. Yes. Very much so. so. No oil at all, which is nice though. It's hard to find recipe books mm -hmm. um, that are oil free and whole food. And we're starting to get more and more, yep. but it wasn't easy. A lot of 
the, um, you know, they just do swaps. They'll just use, you know, a commercial swap for mm -hmm. a plant-based yep. oil product, you know, or like a margarine. And that's not what I do. Or so. you see the big rage of coconut oil. You know, it's just, oh, and yes. coconut, I mean, so, it was not like coconut oil in little jars, it's coconut oil in big containers. It's crazy. It is, I know, and it, you know, makes me think of a couple things. Dr. McDougall, how he always says, you people want good news about yep. their bad habits. Yep. So, you know, solid fat, they want to figure out a way, you know, to, to consume it. And then, I don't know, I'm sure you've seen the new um, Eating You Alive movie. Yes where the line was, the only miracle about coconut oil is that it's still on the market. Correct. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, that just nails it. Because not that mm -hmm. eating coconut, I have nothing against coconut. Right. Fantastic. I mean, the research shows by eat, eating coconut still has saturated fat, but it evens out, right. you know, as far as the health impact with the phytonutrients and the fiber and everything else. But again, when you alter something, mm -hmm. Our ancestors were not making coconut oil. Yeah. Nobody was. So that's just a processed, yeah, processed food. But it's just. But, it is amazing, like when you see the, the the like recipes, or you'll see videos and stuff, and they're like dumping coconut oil into something. And you're like, wow, it's crazy. I know, yeah. but it's actually fun now. My kids know. I mean, I've taught them, so that we'll watch something, and my daughter, who's 11, will say, "Okay, well, I, we would obviously not do that." <laughs> She's like, we don't need that. We can just use oil. We can just use water. Or we can just, and she's, you know, making those little changes. Yeah. She's suggesting those changes, which is so fun because I love getting the kids involved. You know, not only my students, which range from probably 16 or 17 here all the way to their 70s and beyond, but then my kids at home, you know, to give them the tools because we're living right now in an, you know, an omnivore world. And yep. so for them to be able to have the confidence to say, oh yeah, no, we made this at home and it was great. And you know, I didn't feel bad afterwards. So that's fun. And you're also teaching them the skills of cooking and everything else, which is absolutely wonderful. Cause there's, you know, I do cooking classes on the side too. And I always notice that there's, there's a lot of people that don't know how to cook and it's, it goes from like you know, young ages and things because of the both parents working or one parent working. So it's fast food. It's whatever you can get, lean cuisines, um, especially if you walk down the frozen food aisle and you have every type of lean cuisine for a mile long, it's crazy. So it's and there's and then there's people that are baby boomers that have never cooked their entire life, and it's it's fun to teach them the skills. But there's a lot of people that don't know how to cook anymore. Well, and don't know how to cook from ingredients. They cook Correct. from boxes. Correct. If they, you know, because that was the big, you know, after World War yep. II, it was like okay, convenience, and here we go, and and it was the status kind of situation where yep. now getting back to actually the beauty of the fruits and the vegetables and the grains and the legumes and the nuts and the seeds for what they are and mm -hmm. my students will often say I didn't realize food had so much flavor just food because wow. it's masked <laughs> by all that fat and the sugar mm -hmm. and the artificial flavors and so when they actually taste something they just oh it's so fun yeah. they just light up I remember doing a couple of foodie bars for um, like the end of the semester and students saying, can I have an extra plate? I need to bring this home to my mom. I have never had, this is, I've never had food taste wow. this good. Nice. You know, and just, and just to <laughs> see, and then they also then start playing around with cooking yeah. and on, on my website, when I have some of my articles, I feature student stories. And so, you know, I've had students and just a couple. So in 2017, I started a series called From Excusitarian to Doer. So all of yep. my articles are one excuse after another. So we just did one that was, I don't know where to start when it comes to cooking. Mm -hmm. So I had a little student and she, you know, 18, 19 years old. She said, I had no skills. My mom was the one who cooked yep. and she didn't really invite me in the kitchen very much. And sometimes that's a reality in some families. Um, and so she said, I didn't know what to do at all. I was eating fast food, got into college and thought, well, that's just college life. Mm -hmm. You know, you just eat fast food. You go to, you know, coffee shops and that's just normal. And she said, but I wasn't feeling good. You know, I was needing naps and I was tired and I couldn't study and concentrate. And I thought, is this why college is supposed to be hard? Because you hear people say college is hard. True. And then she said, I, when I did your class and I'm, you know, starting to learn about this stuff. And she said, I can't believe it. I went plant-based and I have energy. I don't need a nap. I'm cooking. 
So she developed a little recipe that she could all do 100% in the rice cooker. So it nice. was a rice and vegetables and everything cooks together. And so we did a rice bowl on, um, you know, for the article. Mm-hmm. But she was so proud. She said, I was so proud I cooked this by myself. And it really, they, they need to be, we all need to be more self-sustainable. Okay. This is just... We're not doing well, and it gets expensive to eat out. It does. And it you don't realize that I had another student, and I asked in the beginning. I said, "Now, how many of you guys, you know, pay attention to how much you're spending when you're eating out?" And uh, you know, you don't hear much. And then she came to me afterwards, and she said, "I calculated. I went back to, through my ATM receipts because she always uses her mm-hmm. debit card, and so she could separate it out." And from it was three months that she had been working. She had spent every single penny that she had made in her job on fast food. Eating That's out. crazy. And what was really sad was she was sacrificing study time and family time and all kinds of other things because she was working. Because mm-hmm. she said, I have to work. You know, I mean, I have to pay, pay for the fast food. Yeah. But it was for the fast food. And so she, I said, what would you, you know, if you would have had five or six hundred dollars in that time, you could have spent on something else. And she said, never again. I'm not doing that anymore. So they, I had another student who saved uh, 300 a month, him and his girlfriend. And so they bought a houseboat. They put the money aside and bought a houseboat. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. I'd rather have that. <laughs> I would rather have a houseboat than fast food. Oh my gosh. Well, and that's it. Once you get away from it, and then you feel how good it feels afterwards, mm-hmm. that's easy. You know, I ask them, so after you eat, do you feel like a million bucks? Like you can just, you know, do everything? And they look at me and they say, no, we feel like we want to take a nap. Mm-hmm. And I had one student who said, I feel like what I paid for it, two bucks. I thought, oh my gosh, wow. that's that's a great that's quote. Telling. I know they look at me and say, no, when did you get up? Because I get up real early. I teach five classes back to back minute classes. I mean, I am just like, oh, they say, how do you do it? And I say, plants. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really. WFPB. <laughs> WFPB, whole foods, plant-based. Uh-huh, definitely. Wow. So you talked about, like, when you were talking about your, your foodie bars, because I think that's a really interesting thing, and, it's, and it goes back to people not knowing how to cook or how to put things together. So you're saying that when you come home at 9 o'clock at night, you have things in the refrigerator. So are you doing kind of like batch cooking a little bit to get things ready? Or? Oh, yes. Okay. Tell us a little yeah, bit yeah. about that. So one of the keys, I think, to the success and just success of for our sanity mm-hmm. is having that prep. So yep. doing that, you know, having the plan for the week. doesn't need to be completely detailed, but... On the, you know, the weekend, we'll say, all right, usually Friday, I'll say, okay, you guys, what foodie bars do you want this week? Okay, we want a pasta foodie bar and a nacho foodie bar. All right, perfect. So I will do the cauliflower, I'll do the lentils, you know, I'll do whatever I need to get done ahead of time. And then that way when we get home, we've got the cheese sauce, we have everything in their place. I do a big, I have a crazy salad bar in there, and I do my crazy salad base that I make every single weekend, and then I have, my husband and I have it, he has it for his lunch, and then I bring it to, to work, and then I'll put roasted sweet potatoes and beets and legumes, you know, I'll make sure it's hearty, because again, yeah. I'm teaching five classes, right. this needs to be sustained, you know, the food needs to sustain me, and so I tell my students, I never want to eat out when I'm at work, because my food just tastes so good, and I don't get tired of it, because I do different dressings, and they're all homemade. I make big jars, you know, like I'll reuse olive jars, you know, the yep. large. Yep. And then I will bring them, or just the mason jars, and I'll bring them. You know, I have a little refrigerator in my office, and nothing tastes better. I yep. just love it. And all the flavors, and something too that's a tip is I really like chopping things small, especially for my salads. Yeah. And when students or anyone, they're trying to try new foods and, you know, mm-hmm. especially if they're not salad people, nobody wants a big chunk True. of anything. Yep. And so they, you know, my sister, when we lived, I have a sister that's two years younger. And when we lived together in college, she would want to cook with me. And she'd always say, why am I always the cutter? <laughs> I want the cooker. And I would, I laugh. I'd say, Misty, there's so much chopping with you know, cooking, I mean, yeah. that's really important. And knives, as you know, knives are, if there's one tool in that kitchen, mm-hmm. just travel with their knives because it 
make can make or break yeah. it. So getting a decent knife doesn't have to be expensive, but something that feels good in your hand mm -hmm. and that you can use, th that's key because mm -hmm. if you can learn those skills of just chopping things small and taking the patience to do it and enjoying the process, um, then it will pay dividends all week. I don't try to come home at nine and then say, okay, what is everybody yeah. hungry for? Because it just doesn't go well that way. And then, then all of us succumb to eating out and then mm -hmm. we think it's going to be quicker and then that's not even quicker. I mean, I'd much rather do peanut butter and jelly sandwich at home or peanut butter and banana or peanut butter and apple mm -hmm. if everybody's tired or apples and peanut butter. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's super late. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do that are very, very quick. But having that prep, so usually Sunday is the day that I do um, most of my mm -hmm. prep for the week. Um, and that has served me very, very well. Nice. And especially with all these, the, with the foodie bar, you can have a separate component. So you're not mixing everything together. You know, it's like we have the quinoa, we have the black beans, you know, we have all the different pieces. So, nice. yeah. So what do you do with your lettuces? Because a lot of people, so you'll you'll see a lot of the recipes are out there, and they're like, okay, make your lettuce and stuff, and make your salads for the entire five days. The only problem is if you have romaine or something like that, it gets a little browned around it. So how do you keep that fresh through the rice? So the romaine, if I'm doing romaine, I will rinse it and then I'll wrap it in paper towel. I'll yeah. lay it in paper towel and then roll it up, and we'll keep that in the fridge. And I another because my kids are young enough to be in the kitchen. That means they open the refrigerator and stare. <laughs> with, and that's where they think, with the door open. So I have a second refrigerator in our garage, and that one doesn't get opened nearly as often. So if I have something that I really want to keep, like the salad mix, that will be in the garage fridge. Okay. So I, on purpose, I'm very intentional about what stays in the house fridge and what stays in the garage fridge. Garage fridge. But I've had pretty good luck. I don't add my legumes because they tend to go bad yep. and make things prematurely, um, the lettuce kind of prematurely go bad. But I use um, some fresh kale. I just make sure I use my salad spinner so that I get all of the, you know, as much mm -hmm. of the water off of it. Um, and I put it back usually into the plastic tub yep. and then some Tupperware. I'll put a piece of um, dry paper towel on the top before I put the lid on, mm -hmm. and that helps as well. Um, but I haven't, rarely at the kind of end of the week, things can get a little bit soft depending, but yeah. I'm also a stickler when I buy the greens to make sure they're not already starting to decompose. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, a bad apple in the bunch really makes the whole yeah. bunch go. So there have been many times when I've started to pull a mixed greens out and then think, no, this isn't going to work, and just return it and get another one yeah. just because I know it's going to turn my home mix. Yeah. So. Yeah. I just noticed that I think romaine is the only lettuce and stuff that really gets that brown. It kind of gets the brown on the stems and stuff. So, right. Yeah. Kind of rust a little bit. Yeah. And know, everybody's you, always like, ew. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt you. I mean, unless we get into the slime, you know, right. but it kind of, and I tend to use more of the colorful greens yep. and I do use the romaine, but we, Usually for romaine, I'll chop it right before we eat it. Mm -hmm. Where my other salad mix are the more hearty, the kale, yep. you know, and those other. And I'll do a purple kale or red kale, and then a yellow or a green kale, and then a the lacinato, the dinosaur yep. kale. So I always have those three. I like using. I don't know in your area if you can get the broccoli, the broccoli slaw. Yes, um, I can. So Love we that. have also. I don't know if you have the rainbow salad that's right next to it that uses cauliflower as well. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So that's a, so I'll use that, and that usually I I'll look for the dates. I'm way in the back trying to get the you know oldest, so I can you know make it maximize the the lifespan. But I've had pretty good luck with that, um, just keeping things cold. That sounds good. Wow, thank you. So in the so you you're out there and you're you know you're a dietitian. You have all these things. You're going through the teaching stuff. So what have you learned, or what have you seen about the plant based world, and kind of where things are going? Oh, it's exploding. Yeah. It's so exciting. I mean, just the fact that you walk into a big box store mm -hmm. and see vegan on things that were, I mean, just this idea or going into a restaurant and having them not say vegan yeah. or, I mean, they, they actually understand what's going on. And that, that di the difference between plant-based and vegan mm -hmm. is quite significant because as we know, you can have a vegan quote-unquote diet that's yeah. made of soda and, ch you know, chips. 
However, that seems to be a little bit easier to communicate out True. in the world when you go to a restaurant and they understand no animal mm-hmm. products, and then you can take it to the next level and say, now, as far as the oil goes, you know, can, can we talk about this? Where sometimes if you try to talk to people about plant-based in that situation, it gets confusing. Yeah. But this is, oh, it's so exciting. And the documentaries mm-hmm. like Eating You Alive and What the Health and Cowspiracy, and that they just keep coming. And Dr. Greger just is He's wonderful. strong. And he just keeps... And then all these other doctors that are now featured in these movies. So we're getting that. Kaiser. So we have in our area, Kaiser, Northern California, um, but also Redwood City in the Bay Area. There is a, they had this big kind of directive with um, physician education about how plant-based should be where you get all of your patients nice. to move to. Wow. Um, and it was so neat because at the end of the article, when typically you would, would see, but further research is needed. You know how they always kind of, mm-hmm. it said further research is needed to figure out strategies for making all employees and patients choose plant-based, wow. make plant-based choices. So that was just... That's stand-up. wonderful. Now, it's not, it's a process. I mean, we're getting there, but just that, that idea that it's being recognized. Mm-hmm. And like we had talked about earlier, that awareness where... When people know they have a choice, then it's just so empowering. When you think that your only choice is medication for controlling your diabetes, you may decide you don't want to make changes, but that's with that education, not just this is what the doctor said and I have to keep taking my medication and I'm just going to have to get used to it. So I had one of my coworkers is because I have lots of colleagues that have also transitioned. So my mom and dad, my sister, her husband, her four kids, and my whole family, we've been able to transition. And then I had a dean, and he has since retired, and then all kinds of colleagues throughout you know, our campus have started to make this move or have completely moved over. But I had one who just hosted his family from another state, and when they got there, there were two kids and a um, – and a grandma and the mom. And so they said, we want to eat like you do. And he has recently really made this full transition to plant-based. And so he said, are you sure? Because the kids are six and nine and two boys. And he said, do you know what that means? And they said, yeah, we want to try it. So he said, okay. So he took my book and he, and I was so excited. I was so ecstatic because he planned out all of the meals. They were traveling every day. He took everything with him. He said he had all the little containers. Every, I mean, I was just blown away. And they loved it. The kids loved it. Everybody loved nice. it. And then I just got notification from him yesterday that they went home, right? So they've been home for a week. And the husband had dealt, dealt with Crohn's disease mm-hmm. for years. And they had now been on day six. The husband said they watched what the health on mm-hmm. their own. Mm-hmm. She found it. She was thinking about this. They watched it together. He said, okay, I'm willing. And he was kind of a stubborn guy, but he was really, I mean, when you're hurting, you're hurting. Yep. So he thought maybe I'll try this. So now they're on day six and, um, I should read you the, I mean, it was, I was just blown away by the response. So let me, Okay, let me yes, read Yes, please. Here. So, um, since we all have gone plant-based, my husband is healing. He has gone from having, and this is, okay, so this hasn't been long. He has gone from having major liquid stool 10 plus times every day to yesterday, his first solid poop, and only going once or twice a day. It has been 10 years since he's had a normal bowel movement. He has no more headaches, sleeps through the night, and has his energy back. The doctors told him he would never be he would never not be on meds or be healthy again and to just deal with it. You have given hope back to him. Thank you for introducing the plant based diet. He is still in shock because he only feels because he feels so normal again and it's only day six. Day six. Day six. Mm-hmm. Ten years. Mm-hmm. And you know, I talked about poop as a dietitian. We talk. I talk about poop all the time. You know, I mean, it's something that I'm comfortable with, and so. But 
I, can you imagine how uncomfortable with you would be ten times a day for yeah. your ten years? No. I mean, this is, and for the doctors, they didn't have this in their toolkit apparently, and so for them to just tell him deal with it, yeah. you're never going to be healthy, and you're never going to be not on meds, and those medications can be, oh my gosh, they can be so toxic yep. to the body. Yep. And then to feel this well so fast, mm -hmm. it just... it Six days. It's amazing. I mean, it just brings me to tears. It's yeah. just so incredible. And that's why we are... I, that's why we're on this planet. I really think... I mean, I, I've always felt so passionate about nutrition and always wanted to give everything I could and have the best recommendations for everybody. And I just wear my heart on my sleeve... But then to be able to really help people yeah. is just, I never went into private practice because I told you it was just so frustrating. Mm -hmm. You just don't feel like you could ever really make, you know, I felt like I made more, you know, I made more progress in the ICU yeah. than I did, you know, when I was doing one-on-one -on -one because I, the tools just weren't there. You carb count, yep. um, it just, it's so challenging. So that movie, the uh, Eating You Alive, I don't know if you remember, the very last scene, or one of the last scenes, one of the physicians, she was an emergency room physician, yep. she said, I can look my patients in the eye and I can tell them I can heal you. Yep. And whenever I watch that, I just, I cry, I mean, multiple times, but because I finally feel like that. Yep. I mean, they have to want it, too. I mean, this is... That's probably the most frustrating part now is that I want it so badly for everybody and they may not be there. Correct. You know, and so they have to be the ones that want this, but if they want it, we have it. We can offer it. You're doing your cooking classes, you're doing your summits, mm -hmm. and they just have to be willing to do it and make that decision. Yep. You know, that the power of a decision. Yep. So that you get out of that mess that is moderation. I agree. And, you know, just being comfortable, being uncomfortable. But we have the tools. I mean, we can show them how to do this. And so it's just thrilling to be able to help people because quality of life is okay. everything. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. We appreciate that so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's a community. I, to me, I look at it and it's like, I would rather eat food and good food and great tasting food and make things than I would to take a whole bag of pills. I mean, who wants to carry around a bag of pills like this? It's crazy. Oh, and they just now, so this is the quaternary treatment now, is trying to, so all the different levels, you know, in the medical system, quaternary is now managing the, the side effects of the meds. It's just... Like, no, this, this, this is insanity. Yeah, I and agree. the cost. I mean, talk about, you know, I mentioned that in class, so with diabetes... You know, you get the little blood tester for free, but you have to pay for the strips. Mm -hmm. And I have type 1 diabetics in my classes that spend two or $300 a month yep. on strips. Yep. And my other students look around and think, that's a car payment. Yep. Wow. Just to test the blood. I mean, that, yep. that doesn't do anything to manage the blood sugar. Yep. That's just to test it. Yep. So people just mm -hmm. don't realize, you know, the costs that they are incurring. Okay. And the other thing, too, that gets a little frustrating sometimes is people don't realize how much of a burden they put on their families when they're not in good health until True. it gets to that point. You yep. know, they say, well, I, let me be, and I want to enjoy my life, they'll say. You know, I'm going to eat my <laughs> meat and potatoes, and but they don't realize that. Then that's going to put them at such high risk for all of those diseases that yep. take away their ability to take care of themselves and you know, even just on the vein side of it just you lose your dignity I mean when you can't go to the bathroom by yourself that's a whole nother you know level of being unhappy and then how do you you know go back from that I actually I was at a conference with a friend of mine uh, the pea pod I don't know if you've heard of that plant-based um, disease prevention mm -mm, never so heard of it was at, in New Mexico this past year, and she was talking about working in a, um, doing a class where she had a financial planner that was one of the patients. It was a diabetes class. And so the idea came up about what, how much money do you really need to retire? You know, because that obviously is a concern mm -hmm. as people age. 
And the gentleman had a very interesting answer. He said, it depends on how strong you are. And they said, well, what do you mean? Yeah. And he said, if you can't get up from the toilet, you're going to be really expensive. You're going to need to put a lot of money away. Yep. If you're sickly, then you're going to have to pay for the room next to the nurse's station. And they charge more for those than the ones down the hall. And if you're going to need someone to come in and check in with you, you know, for just once a week, how you doing? We'll take you shopping versus 24 hour care, mm -hmm. nine, 10, 11, 12 thousand dollars a month. It changes everything. And that's no life either. I mean, you know, quality of life is really, so then, you know, dial it all the way back down to, and then we talk about these whole food plant-based choices that not only do they help you in the future, which people are yep. careful at, thinking about the future but they also taste amazing and they make you feel fantastic and they're cheaper and there's no there's no rub i mean it's the only thing is that's not what most people are doing yep i i loved hearing i loved exactly what you were saying about it's not because everybody talks about well how much money do you want to spend to be able to go do trips and see your grandchildren and all those things Truthfully, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, it does a little bit, but it is more about the health care. What do you, you know, how sick are you going to be? How many diseases? All those. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. I used to work in dialysis as a dietitian and talk about, I mean, that's a part-time job for them. Yep. Three, four hours, three times a week. Yep. They, they can't plan any trips that don't involve another dialysis unit. I mean, it's... Sad. And they feel terrible in between. Oh, it's just so difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, but... We've been fed this information that mm -hmm. as you age, you just get sick. Yep. And that's just part of it. And it's your genes, and there's nothing you can do. And so, you know, I mean, I start the very first day of my classes with a little video of Dr. McDougall having, talking about a stroke that he yep. had at 19 and saying, you can control your health destiny. Mm -hmm. And so that starts today, you know, and it does. It starts with your very next bite. Yep. And it's something to celebrate. The, something that you had mentioned that I wanted to also expand on. You were saying that the food that tastes good, and like I said, I love the food that loves you back. I don't want someone putting a label on a food that's either vegetables or vegetarian or vegan or plant-based that doesn't taste fantastic. I agree. Because the truth is, we are going to always be compared. Mm -hmm. So if you know you have a veggie burger, and if it's just kind of okay, mm -hmm. then for the mainstream, they're not gonna. They're always gonna be comparing it. Right. But if you serve something, and you've taken that little extra time to make sure those vegetables are fresh, and you've chopped things small, and the flavors are right there, then they're gonna be able to have that experience and think, yep. "Oh, this is amazing," rather than just something that's mediocre and saying, "Yeah, it wasn't okay." Because even though with the animal products, it's not necessarily tasty. It's just their norm. Right. So they're comparing it, even though when they really think about it, if you ever try to eat a fast food, whatever, really slowly, like I tell my students, chew really well, because that's a huge piece of the nutrition and getting all the, nutri the nutrients from the food, um, but try to really eat, just nibble at your fast food, and they say, oh, it's mm. nasty, it doesn't. It doesn't really taste good. When I inhale it, I don't feel it until after, and then I kind of feel it just bleh. But this isn't like every morsel mm -hmm. that you want to enjoy. They don't have that experience. So when we celebrate the food, and that's why we do our top looks, and that's why we do our cooking demos, and we say, look at the colors, mm -hmm. look at the t Beautiful. textures, and look at the, the, we really can celebrate these foods for what they are, then it just, it's, it's truly a wonderful, full experience and that connection that you make with the food and that it truly nourishes us. Yeah, I fully agree. Thank you so much. So if you had a couple of tips and tricks that you would give everybody um, before we actually, before we have to close and stuff, what would those be? Well, chew your food. You know, I think that's something that a lot of plant-based eaters and very healthy eaters still, we're busy, we're trying to do a lot of things. And so not, yes, and even though it's great food, not chewing your food yeah. makes it difficult also not only to register that mm -hmm. you're eating because the whole mind connection where you feel satiated and satisfied, but just physically 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done to take food from what we recognize on a plate to the micro sized, you know, tiny molecular sized pieces that need to be able to be absorbed through the yeah. small intestine. So it's that's something that we definitely, if you want to take your plant based eating, and John Pierre is wonderful about talking mm -hmm. about this too, take your plant based eating to the next level, it's chew. And to go along with that is breathe. And when you know the physiology behind metabolism, taking food and turning it into fuel, you realize that oxygen is essential in that whole yeah. process. So we can't turn food into fuel without oxygen. But we often are so shallow with our breathing, and it goes along with eating quickly too, but if you are able to, before you start eating, take three cleansing breaths, and I do um, some oxytocin. So there's a couple different schools of thought with breathing. So there's definitely wonderful research about just breathing through your nose, that your mouth should only be used for talking and chewing you know, and, and eating. But there's also some oxytocin breath. So my students kind of giggle at this, but we take a deep breath in through the nose. And then when you breathe out, you make a very low, kind of loud, <laughs> and you kind of have that release and it actually impacts your oxytocin hormones the feel good hormone yep. in your body so if you can do and again if you're by yourself or you're in your car they work great but you can do these oxytocin breaths and even if you just do nice three nice breaths you look at your food and you look to the you notice how beautiful it is and how much this is a treat for you to be able to enjoy such wonderful food and then you chew that food slowly and well and not to the point where you're counting or anything but just so that you're you know we often load up the next fork load before we're even done chewing True. you know the one in our mouth so that definitely just to kind of set the mood um but i also the idea of including legumes in every if you can every meal the research is so fantastic about the blood sugar response yeah. Even the next day, the second meal effect, where you know if you had beans for dinner, and even if they, even if you drank straight glucose for breakfast, the spike is less if you had the black beans the night before in a burrito nice. or however you'd like them. Nice. So trying to incorporate um, and not being afraid of vegetables for breakfast, I think that that's something that again you know people are used to eating these kind of sugary, sweet you know especially if it's like a cereal process. Yeah. But flipping it a little bit, you know, and thinking about having some type of vegetable for breakfast or a savory oatmeal. I love savory oatmeal with some fresh parsley and kale and, and then cabbage. I love red cabbage. I do some avocado toast, you know, with red cabbage and fresh that's cilantro. Good. And so kind of thinking outside, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just in some cultures, there is no sweet for breakfast. I mean, that's just not beans are a very, you know, common mm -hmm. breakfast food beans and bread and different things. So that would be something that I would recommend is just think about food with a sense of wonder and just this is an experiment and this is just playing, yeah. you know, really bring that fun aspect back in and think, what if I did this? How would that work? And you just learn and you learn this, oh gosh, that didn't work very well. <laughs> or this is really fun. This I could, you know, I could experiment in these different yeah. ways. So being open to that, and I love taste testing. Yeah, so too. especially with the kids, you know, if they say, well, I don't like soy milk, say, okay, let's let's line them up. So then you have, you know, two or three different brands, mm -hmm. because as you know, the taste, the texture, everything is different with the different brands. So you have a couple of those, and you put a couple almond milk, and you say, okay, now you guys, let's taste them, mm -hmm. let's rank them in, you know, which we like, and describe what did we like or not like. Because I have had a lot of students who will talk about like a non-dairy milk and say, oh, no, I didn't like it. It, it was way too thick. Like, okay. And then someone else will say, oh, it was way too thin. Yep. You know, because they're different products. And I'll say, well, if you're trying to go, let me know what it is about the food. And then we can try to investigate and mm -hmm. figure out, oh, okay, well, you do like a thicker one. Then maybe a shelf-stable choice is not good because they tend to be thinner. Yep. But the refrigerated products tend to be a little thicker. Yep. You know, so it gives you some something to go with when people can describe it. But when they just say, Oh, I don't like no, that it's... <laughs> it doesn't give you anything. 
you know, to yeah. work with. So I think that taking the pressure off, you know, of feeling like, oh, I have to all of a sudden like all these things, but just saying, well, let's just, with a sense of wonder, you know, kind of just, what would this be like? I wonder what it would taste like. And just in, like, you're a little kid and just enjoying. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah, that's a huge Love piece. it. I love it. I love the breathing. I love the, the chewing, all that kind of stuff. That's great. Thank you so much. And something else, too, as far as sustaining, mm -hmm. you know, because if we want to continue, yep. and that's usually a challenge because people kind of want to fall back into their ways, is find your why. And it's very um, seductive for us, and I don't know if you've fallen into this, but I classically, and I've done it a couple times in our time together, is I would always give all the reasons. You know, I'd say, so, you know, not only does this taste good, but it's good for you and it's going to help prevent, you know, cancer and it's cheaper and da, da, da. And I realized I read a fantastic book called No Sweat by Michelle Seeger, and it's about exercise. It's mm -hmm. actually the science of motivation and, and exercise. But she talked about the more reasons you have the more dilute your motivation becomes, mm. which is really interesting. Exactly. Because I was thinking, I was adding, you know, like, and then this, and then this. And she said it actually, and what they've seen, it makes the person think, well, if it's if it can do all this, then maybe it's not even good at any of it. Yeah. But if you have your one reason, and that's your, that's your, you know, lighthouse, that's your one reason, then it's so, so much stronger. Yeah. So for the kids, you know, I'll ask my kids every once in a while, say, so when I'm not looking, you know, do you guys cheat? And I mean, you know, it's, yeah. and they say, no. And I say, well, why? I mean, are you worried? The animals, we don't want, we don't want to hurt them. And we know that we, that system hurts them. And so we don't want that. So it's interesting, you know, where they are right now, they're not concerned about, you know, other things. They're not concerned about heart disease or, you know, 11 years old. And they know that I am concerned about those things for them in the future, but that doesn't motivate them when they're with their friends. But they know, they they have little, those little stickers that show a dog and a pig, and I'm sure, you know, why would you eat one and, mm -hmm. you know, love the other? Yep. And so they know, they just see that little pig in their mind, you know, and they say, and I, I just, that, that doesn't, that's not food to me. It just isn't, but that's their, that's their why. So, nice. you know, if the why is something you have to dr drill down and maybe you have to ask why five times, you know, if mm -hmm. you say, well, because I want to lose weight, why? Yeah. Because, um, I feel better. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because then I'll be more confident. Why? Right. And then you just keep going until you get that because it, I'm, holding back from sharing my gifts with the world, you know, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. then you come back to that why and it makes all the difference. Yep. Because when you have your why and then you have your decision and you actually make a decision, then that's freedom. Yep. It's wonderful. It is freedom. And I'm sure you have felt that way too. Yep. You know, we go into the grocery store and it doesn't bother me that anything mm -hmm. can be on sale. Yep. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I, I mean, still go I with what I need. Yeah. yeah. And it is free. If you, It's freedom. If you had to look around and make the decisions on every processed food mm -hmm. and you know all of those different things, it is too much. Yeah. It's information overload. But if you know this is what I'm doing and I'm doing this because you know this is why it's important to me, mm -hmm. then it's much easier. And we, you have to do the community. You yeah. have to find the community, whether it's meetup groups, you know, in everybody's areas, they all have, you know, different, yeah. or it's connecting online and with Facebook and, you know, different and reading articles and listening to podcasts. And yeah. I mean, this is so important to know that you're not, we're not alone. True. I was listening to a wonderful um, speech by Philip Wallen, W-O-L-L-E-N. Hmm. He is um, from Australia and amazing. He did this debate called Get Me Off Your Plate. And it was incredible. But he talked about a lot of statistics. And it was, I don't remember what year it was. So it wasn't too long ago, maybe in the last couple of years. But 600 million vegetarians and vegans in the world. He said, so if you put all those people together, the United States is only 300 million. Right. So that's more than everybody here, plus 
a lot of other countries. And it, it's wonderful to mm -hmm. think about that because it is easy to make us feel like we're isolated. True. You know, that there's not that many. But, oh, my goodness, there are a lot. There and are. there are more and more when, you know, you're doing your summits and you're getting the word out and you're doing your cooking classes and sharing the information and I'm doing my, you know, program and all of that. And to feel like you're not alone. Right. That's true. Not all. Yeah. People... We, and we understand, we've all been there, because very few people, now my kids, well, even my kids, I mean, they were five and eight. They didn't grow, they, did, they weren't born into this. Mm -hmm. So most of us came from omnivore. So we've all been there, but we've made this, you know, intentional choice to move over. So they can do it too, no matter what age. Yep, that's um, true. But creating that community, and especially if they feel good, and just telling you know, their friends, they don't have to justify it and sell it. All they have to say is, like Doug Lyle, you know, always say, I don't even know why. It's just, it's working for me. I don't know how long. It's probably not going to work for you. Right. But it's working for me. Yep. You know, and people say, you know, I'll, I'll tell my students, just tell them the truth. You feel better. What are they going to say? No, you don't feel better. Well, they can't argue with that. You don't need to argue. You just need to say, I'm just feeling better than I ever have. I feel better. My skin feels better. I, it's just good. Yep. Yeah, life yep. is just good. Yep. So not so not being apologetic about that. Yep. You know, because I think a lot of us we don't want to be confrontational, and so we don't want to put anybody out of their way, and you know, but to say I feel amazing, yep. I feel fantastic, and I know that when I eat certain things, I don't feel well. So. I'll be happy to bring something to your house, mm -hmm. or if you want to cook together, we can cook together. Um, in my book, I actually have a little um, icon for cook togethers because that is nice. my dream for my students and everybody to do cook togethers instead of go out and eat. Mm -hmm. Why can't they be social in the kitchen? Yep. For you know, those of us who love the kitchen, parties always end up in the kitchen. Yep, I agree. That's where people <laughs> always end up. So why don't you just start there? So have a hummus, you know, showdown. So you got three friends, line up your, you know, Cuisinarts or, you know, your food processors and make three or four different types. You know, use yes. the little foodie bar way and the different seasoning and then do a taste test and then split them up, put them in little containers, take them for the freezer. But and if the recipe flops that you try, you know, you find something crazy on the internet, you think, oh, we have to try this. You know, with aquafaba, you're making yep. meringue cookies or something. And, and if it doesn't work, then you laugh about it and you go, what did we do wrong? Yep. You try know, it's it not intimidating. But when it works, you have a party, you know, and you celebrate, this was fantastic. So creating your own community, you know, and reaching out, mm -hmm. I think... People are, this is about connection. I agree. That's all we really need in life yep. is just a, a nice, strong connection with people and to be healthy enough to enjoy that connection. So, and plant-based does it all. And as you said, we've, there's, what, 599 million people to connect with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so you are not alone. And That's there's more every moment. Yeah. Because someone's going to watch this broadcast and yep. see, oh, my God, I think I can do it. I think I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I think I'm ready to make that decision. Yep. And that, that being an indecision is really tough. It's really hard. And so it's better to just make a decision and then be able to reflect on it than to go back and forth and never really feel like you're giving it a chance. Because as you know, it, you'll feel well. Mm -hmm. If the bigger changes that you make, the better you'll feel. So that's why I have okay. my students do the 21-day kickstart. I don't have them just eliminate one, you know, a tablespoon less of something because you just don't feel that great. Right. But to really give it a chance, then you can feel the benefits and think, oh my gosh, I never knew. I never That's knew so cool. I feel so good. I love that idea. That's great. <laughs> Convert everybody even in the classroom. Yay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, well, I give them the option. Yep. You know, and then when, but a huge piece of it too is the other students talking about it. Yep. They say, I never thought, I never thought I could. And I have students who come in eating white rice and hot dogs yep. for breakfast. That's it. <laughs> and then top ramen for lunch and fast food for dinner. And I look at those little, and I think, how do you even get here? Yep. How does the little body even make it? And then I'm going to expect you to read and study and do homework and listen to me and be, how does that work? And then all of a sudden when they make changes, they're like, everything is just easier in my life. Yep. It's just easier to remember things. 
and I have more energy, and I don't fight with my parents as much. And I mean, it goes far beyond, you know, what you'd think, because it does. It it affects your whole life. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I love you. You are just a ball of energy, and then, like you said, you teach, you know, the five classes back to back, but you have got the energy and things, and I love what you've done. Hold up your cookbook one more time, so I want everybody to remember the name, so they don't have to go back 30 minutes. <laughs> No, so the Foodie Bar Way. So I have my website is thenutritionprofessor.com, yeah. but I also have foodiebars.com. So F O O D I E B A R S.com, and they can order one. And that means the email goes to me, and then we put it, I'll sign a little card and stick it in there, and then my husband will take it to the post office. So it yes. is definitely a home, <laughs> but it's about 300. In five pages or something, and it has a great index. I've spent I probably spent forty five hours just on the index itself. Nice, um, but yeah. <laughs> so everything about that book is intentional. Um, so it really is um, made to meet you where you are. Perfect. Well, watch for an email from me because I'm to support you and everything that you do. I will be ordering one of your cookbooks. Thank you. I love cookbooks. That's my that's my kind of fetish. <laughs> Oh, I have that same disease. Yeah, yeah. Yes. love it. I love wonderful. it. Well, thank you thank so much you. today for joining us. I so much appreciate it. And like I said, your your energy and what you bring to the table and just all of your nutrition background and things is, is fabulous. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We will talk to you soon. Have a good day.